Yesterday, I went outside and I stood in the sunshine. And I live on a busy street, which to some could be a nuisance, not to me, because when I step outside, I see my fellow New Yorkers. I see their faces as they walk by. And with that bright, beautiful sun shining on our faces on that warm, gorgeous November day, I thought, this November 7th is the most lovely day I think I've ever seen. And I've grown to be suspicious of gorgeous days. September 11, 2001 taught me that horrible lesson because I never remembered a crisper or more beautiful sky than we saw that day here. And 19 years later, I was okay with the sky, unafraid any longer, and ready for the reckoning. Or am I? And that's what the prophet Amos asks in our text today. Are we ready for the reckoning, for the day of the Lord? If we were to stand before our God, would we be prepared? Would we, we be counted among the righteous? Would God be pleased by what we had to show for ourselves? These are questions, of course, that religion has lots to say about. And many who've grown up in church have been, and it's not just church, but I'm going to talk about church because that's our tradition, but they've been taught, you've been taught, specific markers of how the righteous are to be recognized. They tie it to their church, probably publicly. You can too. Just kidding. I mean, you should tie it, but anyway. They have mannerisms that are familiar. They dress with modesty. They follow the codes set forth by their communities. And we're familiar with how this tends to go. The righteous, many, many religious communities will teach, are obvious to see. You know them when you see them because they're following the rules. And they want to see the day of the Lord and ask for it in full confidence that because they did these things, the judgment would pass them by. But I, what I want to say to you is this. Amos teaches us that God rejects all this wholesale. Gestures that do not reflect God's righteousness are empty. Furthermore, most worship we know and see is worship of its own self that has absolutely nothing to do with God. See, as Will Gaffney put it, Amos was a poor mi migrant farm worker. He traveled to and fro across the very divided kingdom he lived in and saw the suffering of the poor as he also witnessed the largesse of the rich who would walk right past the suffering on their way to worship. It's like when we step over a person sleeping on the street to get into the doors of the church or draw ourselves out to fancy neighborhoods or suburbs or exurbs where we can go worship without ever having to see someone outside of our own income level or race. And then when we go into our houses of empty worship, and ignore the cries of the poor in our modest dress with loud music. And then we start pointing fingers at our adversaries and blame the poor and the suffering for their own condition and celebrate our riches and largesse as if God intended only for us to thrive and start hating our enemies and locking them up in chains. And then we sing loud songs of praise to white Jesus. When all of this happens, our empty worship is enshrouding evil. And we are worshiping something, but it's not God. Amos, the prophet Amos is saying that all over the place, 
there are temples to something, but not to God, who despises this empty praise, who rejects this false piety entirely. This is, by the way, the difference between righteousness and self-righteousness. The religious must learn to make this distinction, especially since we so often get it wrong. The self-righteous brazenly call on the day of the Lord in order to vanquish their enemies. The righteous live rightly by their neighbors, including their enemies. Jesus makes this clear for us, of course. When the man asked the lawyer, asked the teacher, Jesus' teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Or in other words, how do I survive the day of the Lord? What was Jesus' answer but to take the Shema and add a twist? You should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your mind and all of your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. But who is my neighbor? Everyone. Every single one. The ones you like and the ones you don't. The ones who call you to complain about every little thing, that neighbor too. The ones who voted for the other guy and the ones who most certainly didn't. We cannot worship God when we worship rugged individualism more. We do not love our neighbor when we let a virus kill them. We do not love our neighbor when we spit on them and call them nigger. We do not love our neighbor when we condemn their lifestyle. We do not love our neighbor when we refuse the truth and live by pernicious lies. And the truth here is this, justice teaches us what is right. Righteousness lives out what's right as we love our neighbor just as much as we love ourselves. And folks here in this country, the divided kingdom is before us. And as we stand in the light of day, we might just be standing there in more self-righteousness than true righteousness. And if that's the case, I need to tell you, and would not be doing my job if I didn't tell you, that God has a warning. The reckoning is coming. And it won't be pretty, it can't be. It will not be pretty, and it can't be. In order to bring about righteousness, everything has to change, everything. There will not be any more billionaires. We will all do our fair share. We will honor each other. We will shake everything up. We won't be able to hide behind our fortresses and our gated subdivisions and our guns. Those weapons will turn into snakes, God says. But the reckoning is coming and God's justice, the decision and justice is the decision on what is right. God's justice shall be served. Right now, we know so little justice that I'm not sure we would even know it if we saw it. And that's a problem. In this divided country, it's no surprise that there are already calls to bypass justice, to look past misdeeds like, say, chattel slavery or the kidnapping of children and so-called family separation policies. Move on, we're told. Unify, reconcile. But there will be no unity. There will be no reconciliation until justice is served. There must be a reckoning. There must be an emphatic rejection of the evils that befall us. Otherwise, who are we worshiping? What are we doing? The reckoning must come like a storm and blow through everything that harms somebody else. If your neighbor isn't being loved, fully loved, then there's no justice, period. A loved neighbor isn't homeless. 
or in jail or in ICE detention or deported. A loved neighbor isn't walled off by build that fence. A loved neighbor thrives, has the chance to pursue their love fully, has everything they need. A loved neighbor hopes for nothing that they need. And when that's not the case, and when that's not what we pursue with all that we have, when I have to be honest with you, that reckoning doesn't look so good for us. Righteousness means fixing just that, setting it right. And we need a Jesus, real Jesus, to show us this, by the way. And he was about that life, and he expects us to be too, knowing that we will stumble on the way, but come back to Jesus so that we go back to the life he showed us how to live. I look out the windows here, and in New York City, it's another gorgeous day. Here or wherever you are, I encourage us to go out and let that beautiful sun shine warm in our faces and see the shine, sun shine warm on the face of our neighbors and pray for the reckoning to come right now. And just to be very clear, to realize that we have to, as the reckoning comes, be ready to change everything. Like it says. Amen.